Loving and gracious God, we thank you for your scripture and for the truth it speaks to us. Right now we ask that you give us ears to hear what you have for us. And I ask that you take my words and use them for your glory. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So starting at verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing one another. And seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, him being Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? The question from the scribe, which commandment is the first of all, came to Jesus right after Jesus had asked, uh, been asked two other questions. One by, by a group of Pharisees where they had tried to kind of paint Jesus into a corner by saying, well, Jesus, what do you think about taxes? And then another question that came from the Sadducees, which, which challenged the theology around resurrection. Now, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they didn't always get along, but they did get along in one way. They both disagreed with Jesus. They were both threatened by Jesus. And, and Pharisees, they held tightly to ritual, often leaning on the oral interpretations as long as those oral interpretations of Scripture fit into their agenda. And the Sadducees, they, they held um, strictly to the written word of God, which at the time was the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They, they were written down. Now, historically, the Pharisees were seen as the progressive crowd, believe it or not, and the Sadducees were seen as the, the conservative crowd. And as Jesus is debating the two groups, a scribe comes up, essentially a scholar who's well-versed in Jewish law and who probably enjoyed a good debate, like every lawyer does, and heard them and said, well, what's the most important commandment? What's the most important commandment? Are there any lawyers here this morning? Ron, I got a question for you. What's the primary role of a lawyer? What's their primary job? To get paid. <laughs> wow. Wow. Any other lawyers want to ask what the primary role of a, a lawyer is? There's a footnote to that. The, the footnote to that. Ensure justice by finding truth. finding truth, interpreting the law, applying, applying the law, um, applying the law. So, so uh, interpreting, applying the law. So, so a scribe had over 600 laws to work through, and they were constantly figuring out how to apply them. Constantly figuring out, well, what's most important? When you stack them up against one another, which one is most important? And so the scribes, his question to Jesus isn't as confrontational as the Pharisees' first question or the Sadducees' second question. It's more of, hey, let's see if he knows his stuff. I, I like to debate. Let's, let's see if he knows his stuff. And so, so Jesus answered the scribe. The first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. And I love that Mark included this last line. After, after the Pharisees had challenged him, after the Sadducees had challenged him, the scribe had, had asked him a question. Mark says, ah, all right, N nobody else had any, any other questions. It's as if Jesus had kind of put everyone in their place, Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes. No one else was ready to challenge him. Now, all four Gospels, they, they tell stories about how Jesus modeled loving God and loving other people. And there are plenty of parables where, where Jesus calls those who are listening to him to love well. But here he puts it as straightforward, as plain and simple as possible. Love God and love neighbors. 
Now, in order to, to satisfy the scribe, he points back to Deuteronomy 6, uh, it, to, to a common prayer called the Shema. It, it literally means, the Shema literally means to listen. And it's a phrase that, that devout Jews repeat daily. And by using this prayer, Jesus is, is doing two things. First, he, he's, he's claiming that, that his work, that his teaching, all that Jesus had, had done in Jerusalem was in line with the central prayer of Judaism. His goal wasn't to introduce something new. And he's also challenging those who follow him to take the Shema seriously. It's not some stale prayer that you just kind of say out of memory and don't actually live it out. It's something that you, you do. It's something that you, you take and you live out in your daily life. Now it starts with loving God with all of our, our heart, soul, mind, and, and strength. And I'm not going to try to do the, uh, all the signs for those, Jody. That was awesome. Uh-huh. Typically, these words from Deuteronomy would be written on the doorpost of a, of a Jewish home. So every time you would leave your house, you would be reminded of them, be reminded of your priorities as you leave your house to go on throughout your day. And then every time you'd get home, you'd kind of check yourself and say, well, how'd I do? Did I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength today? How, how did I do? You would take a bit of an inventory. Did my actions match what I claim to be most important? Now, in the Greek language, heart, the, the heart is, is the place where your, your purpose or your deepest desires resided, resided. And in the Hebrew world, it's the place that your senses or emotions lived. For the soul, in both Greek and in Hebrew, the soul carries a connotation of breath. It's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where God breathes the breath of life into the nostrils of humankind. And in classical Greek, that this word for, for soul here is the word that, that, that Homer uses to separate something that's living and not living, the, the soul. Now, when we get to mind, the, the original Shema in Deuteronomy, it didn't include mind, but, but the idea would have been tied up in, in soul. Soul and mind would have been tied up in, in one thing. It would have been implied. It's almost an extension of the soul. We could read this word in Mark, the one that Mark uses, that Jesus says, as, as kind of your focus, your attention. Love God. Give God all of your attention. Give God all of your, your focus. And with strength, we're not just talking about physical strength. I do remember that one. We're not just talking about physical strength. We're, we're talking about loving God with all of our abilities, with all of our gifts, everything that, that we have. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. A picture of the complete self. It's flesh, will, and physical gifts. And in the scribe's mind, as well as in Jesus's, it was the ultimate calling. Love God with all of who you are, with all of what you have. Everything else is secondary. So we interpret every other law after that. Every other law comes, comes after that. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He, he also says, and love your neighbor as yourself. It was a familiar law to the scribe, and, and really to everyone else who was probably gathered around who was listening. It's right out of Leviticus. But it wasn't something that was considered as, as primary or as the same level as, as the Shema was. And for Jesus, though, they are completely connected. They're completely connected with one another. It's, it's take, taking the principle of loving God with our whole selves and putting it into, into action. They're, they are completely connected. You can't do one without the other. About nine years ago, there were a group of pastors in, in Denver, Colorado, that, that came together to try to figure out how their churches could work together to serve their city. And for weeks, they got together to pray with one another, to, to brainstorm with one another, to, to figure out how could they approach the problems of, of crime, of drug and alcohol use, of, of, of kids who were raising themselves, of homebound people who couldn't get out on, on their own. How could they approach all of these issues, really issues that any community faces? 
And eventually, after praying and meeting together, they said, well, let's, let's expand the conversation. Let's bring others into the conversation. So they brought in some city officials, and they had those same conversations with city officials. And eventually, the city officials got the mayor to join in. And, and they said, well, what do we do? Hey, this group of pastors, what do we do to, to help our city solve these challenges? And, and the mayor, during the meeting that the mayor came to, said... The majority of the issues that our community is facing would be eliminated or drastically reduced if we could just figure out a way to become a community of good neighbors. All of those problems would be eliminated or at least drastically reduced if we learn to become a community of good neighbors. The the mayor didn't know it, but he was essentially saying, Our issues could be solved if we just took Jesus' words and actually applied them to how we lived. If we actually did what Jesus said, these problems would would be greatly reduced. And and what followed out of this meeting with the mayors and the city's officials was an initiative and and a book titled The Art of of Neighboring. And, And the pastors began to work together trying to help people in their churches to get to know other people in their neighborhoods. Not for the sake of getting those people to come to their church, but simply because Jesus tells us to love our neighbors. And it's really hard to love people who we don't know. It's really hard to love someone who who, who you don't know. So I've got a couple of challenges for us, post-Easter challenges for us this week, two of them, as we try to live as people who are shaped by the resurrection. First is this. How many of your neighbors do you know? Three? Five? Ten? Take some time this week and write down every name you can think of of the person who lives around you. I'm serious. Take some time. Write it down. Think of every name of the person on your street, in your complex, whatever it is that that you, you know. And if you can, don't just stop with names. How much of their story do you know? Where are they from? What do they do? Where, where did they end up in your neighborhood? Why did they end up in your neighborhood? And then I want to challenge you to actually talk to them. To actually get to know them. And waving at someone as they drive by, it doesn't count. (laughs) I'm asking you to begin to get to know someone who lives near you. Now I want you to hear me, I'm not asking you to invite them to church. I'm asking you to get to know a neighbor. Just say hi. Hi, what's your name? Or it might be the, the kind of embarrassing moment where you have to say, hey, you know, I know we've been neighbors for 10 years. And I'm so sorry, but I just, I haven't introduced myself to you yet. My name is Dave. And, and, and sometimes when you've been living in the same place for a long time, that's, that's hard. And unless you want to make it really weird, don't say, so my pastor told me I had to do this. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know a neighbor this week. That's that's all I'm asking. And the second challenge uh, might be a little easier. Might be a little easier. Write down the date in your bulletin, May 12th. Write down the date in your bulletin, May 12th. May 12th is a day um, that's called Action Serve Day, and uh, we'll have more information coming in the next couple weeks, Uh, and I know some of you have participated in Serve Day in in the past, but but Action is a network of of churches in Ventura County who commit to serving the community together, and it actually came out of that same initiative that started in Denver. Um, So on May 12th, there'll be different projects spread out throughout the community uh, with tangible opportunities simply to show our neighbors, that the Christian community in our neighborhood cares for them. No ulterior motive, just that. We care for you. We care for you. So write down that day, May 12th. We'll we'll tell you more about that in the next coming weeks. When Luke tells the story of of Jesus being questioned by the scribe, and Jesus responds with the Shema and, and, and the command to love our neighbors, the same story that, that we're reading in Mark here, when Luke tells the story, the scribe, 
picks up on what Jesus says and says, well, well who's my neighbor? And that's where we get the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. And we're not gonna pick apart the whole parable this morning, but, but one of the most significant parts of that story that Jesus tells is that the Samaritan stopped and physically walks over to the man who was beaten. He stopped and physically went to him. He doesn't stand on the other side of the street and say, hey, are you all right? He doesn't see him standing over there and just kind of throw some money at him and keep going. He stops and he walks to him. And he says, hey, hey, can I, can I help you? He, he gets to know him. He takes the time to presumably get to know him. And it's only then that he can begin to take care of the man's needs. He had to be intentional. The same is true for you and for me. Loving our, our neighbor isn't something that comes without effort. It takes intentionality. It takes sometimes being pushed outside of our, our comfort zone. So as we respond to what we celebrated last Easter with, with, East, with Jesus rising from the grave, let's be a people who are shaped by that Easter moment, who, who take Jesus' greatest commandment seriously. May we be a church full of people who love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and who love God by showing it and loving our neighbors. Let's pray. Loving God, Help us to take your word and to apply it to our lives. Help us to respond to Easter in a way that makes a deep impact in our neighborhoods, our communities, and the whole world. We pray these things in your name. Amen.